Welcome into Bucks Insider Live. Casey Phillips here with senior writer and editor Scott Smith. We are going to talk about everything you need to know, getting you caught up on the Buccaneers world, which is going to start on a more depressing note as we look <laughs> back at this last game. Uh, so much it. for being in the holiday spirit this week. <laughs> it's been it's been so sad because, I mean, the team has done so many incredible things in the community and done so many holiday That's events, and point. it's been awesome. So I love to focus on that. But, of course, it puts such a damper on it when you have a game like this last Sunday. So what are the biggest takeaways from the game for you of what this team can, I don't know, learn from this to move forward at this point. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. That's putting this um, on you. Don't don't play a rookie making his first ever start. Yeah. I don't know. It. I mean, it, it was a lot of the same problems creeping up again. Third down issues, um, protection issues, critical penalties. I mean, the penalties were absolutely killer. I, the first three penalties cost the Bucks a sack on the first play of the game a third down stop in the end zone where they eventually scored a touchdown and a 68 yard touchdown for Mike Evans. So it was kind of a demoralizing afternoon because even when the good things happened, they were almost immediately erased by something else. And the Buccaneers just got beat in every phase of the game. And it, it, doesn't, tell, it doesn't say to me that this is how the Buccaneers can play and will play going forward, but it definitely was a bad afternoon. Yeah, and the the one bright spot for me that I would love to focus on is Devin Tompkins sure. in the return game. So tell us what you saw from him and just mm -hmm. how exciting this could be moving forward. Yeah, the funny thing about Devin is he wasn't too far away from making the active roster at the start of the season, and Coach Bowles talked about that yesterday. We I remember back in training camp, we were raving about him on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. I remember the joint practices in Tennessee, he put on a show. Yeah. And the guy is... He, okay, he had a huge year at Utah State, like 1,700 yards and 10 touchdowns, something like that. Uh, he's fast, he's elusive, and yet he goes undrafted. And why is that? Well, he's generously listed at 5'8 and about 155 pounds. So, that is generous, yeah. Yeah, he's a small guy. And, um, you know, guys that size don't really last in the NFL very often or make it to the NFL, but he has a lot of talents. And Coach said mainly the reason he didn't make the roster to start the season was he just didn't really have the offense yet. He didn't mm -hmm. know the offense well enough yet. But they kept him on the practice squad the whole time, and now it's three months later, and he's had a lot of time to learn things. So he looked great returning kicks. He was he was he accelerated quickly, made moves on on the run, like at top speed. He was making these moves, and he had the longest kickoff return the Bucks have had in ten years. So it was the first time. This is amazing, by the way. After his 54-yard kickoff return against the 49ers, that was the first time since week four that the Buccaneers have started a drive in opposing territory. Wow. it's That's insane. It's because of the lack of turnovers, obviously, but also the lack of really a big spark in the return game. So, you know, he technically is still on the practice squad, but obviously they're going to find a way to get him on the active roster. He's got one more elevation to go, uh, but uh, he's looking good. He looked really good during the returns, and Coach Bowles said yesterday, he said, yeah, he's there. We'll use him. So he could get some looks on, on offense. Yeah, and I, I think that to your point about where they're starting drives, when an offense is already struggling a little bit, that is mm -hmm. not helpful to it have to not. know that you're going to go <laughs> that far. And so, um, and especially when it feels like this is a team that has to work so hard for the yards that they get that it is less in terms Lack of, the of explosive, explosive plays, plays yeah. and all of that that it's this grind it out or you get an explosive play and something hampers it like a like a penalty or something so what do you see from the idea of the explosive plays when this has the it seems like there are the guys that can do it but it just feels like it just yeah. hasn't quite been clicking yeah and we are so used to getting them the last two years and especially 2020 the Super Bowl year but um, it's not that they're not trying. You, we've seen like Julio Jones, Scotty Miller. There were several deep shots in that game, and then a beautiful one to Mike Evans that gets called back. We are taking fewer shots downfield, and I think that's because of protection issues. But probably the bigger issue is that those shots aren't working as well. And, and, and this graphic here is going to use some sort of exotic stats from Next Gen Stats. And the first one is completion percentage over expected, which basically is what it sounds like. like how many passes should have been completed and how many did and if the number's plus that means you you threw the ball better than you were expected to and the second one is EPA per drop back expected points added per drop back it's kind of like war in baseball most people don't actually know how it's calculated and what goes into it but it's kind of an accepted stat it's kind I of love that there's just like a wizard behind the right? scenes like in yeah. Wizard of Oz that's just you know magically coming up with these numbers <laughs> EPA is kind of well regarded stat at this point you hear it all the time now and just know that higher numbers are better so if you look at both of those categories over the last three years yes the number of sh deep vertical routes and that's post corners uh, goes and wheel routes are what goes into that <clears throat> 
They're down a little bit, but the bigger problem is they're just not hitting them. Look at the completion percentage over expected. That's a huge change, wow. especially from 2020. So, you know, they're still trying to hit those deep shots. A lot of people saying, oh, do you, don't you need to throw the ball downfield more? Well, we really did. Yep. And uh, we really did in, in a lot like Cleveland. I think Tom tried to hit Mike Evans five times on go routes and just they're just not hitting them. Yeah, it's so interesting. I know that one area that has been working lately that's great is, is Chris Godwin. We talked a little bit about this last week that he seems back to almost, if not completely, full Chris Godwin form. Right. Um, and they are definitely putting him to work in terms of both his blocking and he's just that guy that seems to always be the a bit of the safety blanket. And I think that's something we talked about when Gronk left was when we asked about you know who was going to fill some of these roles that Gronk did, and it didn't necessarily mean the exact same routes or the exact same guy, but to me that security blanket option, it feels like Chris Godwin is kind of taking that role yeah. now. Plus he works out of the slot a lot, mm -hmm. and if you are trying to get rid of the ball quickly, that's the guy you're going to look to a lot. Uh, he also did have our biggest play in that game, though, like a 32-yarder down the seam. So he could do a lot of different things, but yes, I think he is a security blanket, as you say. And uh, he's actually, you talked about him rounding into form. He's just getting targeted a lot because, you know, he's back to full Chris Godwin at this point. And he's now caught at least five passes in 10 straight games, which is the second longest streak in team history. It's the longest streak by any player in the NFL this year. So he's a high-volume guy for sure, and you can pretty much guarantee every game that Tom's going to look to him a lot. You know, sometimes it's a Mike Evans game and sometimes it's not, right? He might get 10 targets one game and three the next, but Chris is always intricately involved in what we're doing. Okay, and then uh, I know that it's so weird to talk about, after, especially after a game like that, but the Bucks are in the first are in first place. <laughs> this has just been such a bizarre. We've been saying this every week. Every week, uh, oh. you know that no matter what happens, it seems like the Bucks just get to stay in that first place uh, spot. And so I know that after this, we're going to be shooting our first path to the playoffs. And so you know we're going to talk a lot more about it there. But for now, let's um, get a little bit into the idea of at these last few games. What are we going to be watching in terms of? Of course, obviously, if Bucks went out. They control their own destiny, but. What are the other teams that we're watching, and, and what are some of the different implications here? Yeah, I think we used a graphic like this last week uh, when we were talking about the road to the playoffs, and we only had the Bucks and the and the Falcons on there, but uh, the Panthers beat Seattle, I believe it was in Seattle, and are now equal with, with Atlanta, and one game behind the Buccaneers. And they actually, people love to say this, control their own destiny. Mm -hmm. I'm doing air quotes. You can't see me right now. Um, because if they win all of their four remaining games, they will win the division. But that's because the Buccaneers are one of their games. So the Buccaneers also control their own destiny in that if they win their last four games. But with a, with a one-game lead, they have a little bit more of a cushion, right? But I tell you what, if the next few weeks uh, don't go as well as the Buccaneers would hope in terms of their results and the Panthers' results, that Week 17 game suddenly looms very large. I've been focusing on the Week 18 game against Atlanta, but that Week 17 game at home against Carolina, who already beat us, that's the big problem. Because if they beat us again, they got a really good tiebreaker, right? Whereas we already beat Atlanta earlier in the season in Week 5. So uh, it's this game coming up against Cincinnati, it's very, very important. Don't get me wrong. It's very important. But of the four remaining games, in terms of what it's going to mean to you uh, in the in the NFC South race, it's the least important. You still right. really need to win it. But since it doesn't really affect your NFC division and conference tiebreakers, it's a little less important. I am of the opinion that this is all going to come down to Week 17 and 18. Yeah, which <clears throat> is going to be fascinating television, <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, all right, we have a question, a couple questions from Richard, and so based on what we were just talking about with the Cincy game, he said, thoughts on Cincy coming to town? What are some weaknesses of them that the Bucks can take advantage of? They don't really have a ton of weaknesses. Yep. Um, they did a lot to revamp their offensive line. Obviously, that's pretty much the entire story of their offseason after Joe Burrow was sacked 70 times, including the postseason last year. You know, they took Alex Kappa from us. They, they basically have four new starters on the offensive line. And it's been improved, but he's still, Joe Burrow's still been sacked 35 times. So there's, there's an opportunity for the Bucks maybe to get some pressure on him, which is important because he's just so cool and calm and collected back there. Um, and otherwise, uh, they don't have glaring weaknesses. Their defense, most of their defensive numbers are basically middle of the pack. So, uh, you know, the Buccaneers probably don't want to get into a shootout with Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase, but it's not as oppressive of a defense as the one we faced last week in San Francisco. Okay, and then his other question uh, was, who is our backup inside linebacker now that we have waived <clears throat> Fadukasi? Well, we just got K.J. Britt back last week, and he was actually, when the season started, was was and 
the main reserve for both Levante David and Devin White. So he's the guy. Fadakasi became that guy because KJ Britt was on injured reserve, but Britt is the guy that they really want there. He's the third. Now, by waving Fadakasi, you take your inside linebacker depth back down to three, and they always want four of those guys on game day. So I believe there will be some kind of maneuvers, maybe, maybe, um, elevations from the practice squad or something. They'll find a fourth guy to fill out that and also play on special teams. But the answer to the question is KJ Britt. All right. Well, that is going to do it for us on this edition of Bucks Insider Live. Thank you guys so much for being with us and for those questions. And we'll be back here next week.